let me come now to our um, last um, member on this panel, who is uh, Shalini Uma Chandran, who is a journalist who's previously worked with uh, papers like the Times of India, the Hindu, the Economic Times, and is now the editor of Mint Lounge, which is the online and print magazine of a uh, very well-known financial daily, the Mint. And the most important thing, of course, as um, Swarna told us earlier, is that she is also the author of the Pragna report on gender violence, which I personally consider a very, very important document uh, because it really gives us all the available information uh, on the whole question of violence against women uh, to activists and research scholars in this country. And uh, she's worked as a reporter and an editor for several uh, years. She's written on disability rights and urban issues, on gender, I think on the arts and tried to sort of look at it from all these perspectives. And um, she's also the author of a book, uh, You Can Make Your, Dr uh, Make Your Dreams Work, uh, which narrates 15 stories of people who switched careers to pursue what they love. So great that we have Shalini with us and over to her. Thank you, Shalini. Thank you, Karan. Um, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's, it's really been good to hear all of you and to see so many of you after so long. Um, so Swarna essentially want, asked me to talk about um, the reporting in general. I mean, if how you one reports on gender-based violence and um, the general media coverage as well. So I've um, been a journalist for nearly 20 years. And actually, the first survivor of a murder attempt who I met was a woman whose husband had been killed because they married against their family's wishes. It's actually the Megla case, which uh, Kadir spoke about earlier. Um, so this was about 12, 11, 12 years ago. She had survived the attack, but he'd been killed. Um, so when I got there and I met her, she was still in hospital. And uh, what has stayed with me since then really was how um, very baffled she seemed by what had happened. Her eyes were just blank. And uh, she just kept saying over and over that she couldn't make sense of what was happening. So that's the, that was a report that needed to be filed. So I did it. And then I started looking back for older um, stories and how this, how had this issue been covered? And, um, and even then I wasn't, uh, um, I mean, even then I, I didn't know as much then, but I still don't know that much, but I still didn't like the term honor killing even at that point. And I still don't, but I mean, just it's easier for everyone to understand. But uh, when I went back over these old reports, uh, old news reports and all of that, I was, I just found that very often the survivors or the victims, um, how they were actually affected as human beings was erased from these reports. So you didn't really uh, see, learn about I mean, I, I know it could sound intrusive, but I think we also need to hear about how drastically their lives change and how shocking it is that you make a personal choice for yourself or you, um, and then your entire family turns against you in, in such a horrendous way. And very often these couples or one of them is lured back home on the pretext that the family has forgiven them and then they get killed. So this was the case here also. So, um, so you either had these kind of reports, which were very objective, which was very good, but also is uh, left a lot out, I felt. Otherwise, you had all these academic reports and papers, which just dealt with it as this very sociological problem. So anyway, I continued to report or follow the reporting on these cases. Then in 2012, uh, there's this um, Dalit colony in Tamil Nadu called Natham. So it was burned down to the ground after... A young man from there uh, married a woman from an upper caste uh, village across the road. Um, I think they did both. They basically, it, the village is on either side of the road and they literally crossed the road and all of this happened. So the ashamed, fa the father was so ashamed of the woman, was so ashamed that he died by suicide. And then, um, then this led to a riot and uh, the upper caste. I think a bunch of villagers got together and came and burnt down the colony from this where this boy, this young man was. 
So I mean, I went, I was there um, about a week later, I think. And so in the colony, there was another woman who was standing it basically in the, like sifting through the ashes of our house. And she was saying, see, she was a tailor and her sewing machine had been smashed and then burnt. And then over and over, whichever family you met, they told stories of how the valuables in the house had been pulled out first, smashed, damaged. And uh, then the fire was set. So this elopement really seemed to have become a reason to target livelihoods of upwardly mobile Dalits. And then anyway, some days later, uh, the young man was also found dead. We still are not completely sure whether it was uh, a killing or a suicide, but that was uh, that case as well. But what, so what we call honor killings, really, it's, it's not just limited to patriarchy, gender, caste. It is, as um, people before have said, it's also about personal choice. So it's, um, it's also about a society that doesn't respect the idea of personal, economic, and political freedom. And just, just I think it's just, yeah, that's, that's something we also need to widen our own uh, understanding and reporting of it so that all of this comes into it as well. It's not, um, so of course, um, if you look at it, both men and women, of course, uh, more women than men are killed. But both men and women are killed when they cross these lines that society has drawn for them. And it's not just inter-religious or inter-caste marriages that turns families into murderers. Uh, in India, at least two people from the same subgroup or, or any kind of grouping which is not uh, uh, approved of, if they fall in love, this could send clans into these murderous ranges. So, um, but it's also partly this refusal to acknowledge and to accept and to understand the need for personal freedom, uh, which, which we see at a very personal and family level. I think that's also what we're seeing in other areas of society now. It's, it's, it's spread much wider. We're seeing it in government policies. We see it in this very casual and, almost, and toxic bigotry that we, that we see around us regularly in real life on social media. So it's um, uh, it's not just a so family issue is what I'm trying to say that when this, at least that's how I look at it. And uh, so about 10 years ago, there was really no clear data on these murders. So um, these killings were just recorded under the subhead of murder or assault or suicide under the Indian Penal Code. They were not recorded as uh, honor killings or any of these things. And this was one of the challenges to reporting. So you had to either search through questions which were asked in the state legislatures or in the parliament. You'd have to talk to nonprofits, women's groups, lawyers who took on these cases to actually get a sense of the problem. So that's where organizations like IDWA and Evidence have uh, are really important because any a lot of the documentation that we do have is because they've done it. And uh, it's only from 2014 that uh, these crimes are actually recorded separately in the NCRP, the National Crime Records Bureau. But um, um, but what happened was that um, then again, but in 2017, the same NCRP report decided to drop this category, saying the data for honor killings was unreliable or vague. And it was re then it was again because of this big outcry. So it was reintroduced the next year. But the, the official record is one death in 2018. But uh, Kadir's team itself, I think, has recorded uh, way more just in Tamil Nadu, just one state. And apparently nationwide, we had just one uh, case. But uh, so this search for data in that sense is one big challenge. And very often the police from the region will be from the dominant caste or will be trying to supposedly keep the peace. And therefore, you know, that becomes difficult. That's another, uh, that's something else you have to sum out as well when you're trying to get the actual facts of the case. But um, lack of data obviously doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. For instance, Monday we had a case of a 19 year old woman uh, who was beheaded because she married against her family's wishes. And last month, um, end of November, the Supreme Court had said that uh, it's time civil society actually reacts 
and speaks out a lot more against caste-based crimes. Uh, it was uh, upholding a petition, uh, I mean, a sentence on an old case from 1991. So there's also that the cases take so long to travel through um, the courts. But most of the underreporting is by the state. It's not by the media it's, or by civil society organizations. So journalists do cover all of these, a lot of these murders in detail. Uh, civil society organizations do a lot of documentation. And in the past decade, uh, media reporting on, uh, on honor killings has become more detailed. It's much more careful. And of course, um, not in all cases, but in most cases, it's also more sensitive. Um, so, but apart from the language in news reports and stories uh, and the way we write, I think uh, we also need to be far more mindful of the way we uh, speak, behave, the language we use in our everyday lives, in our newsrooms, in society, when we're speaking with our friends and in our attitudes in general, so that people can actually make their own decisions on how they want to live their own lives and don't have to follow some archaic rules that someone else decides on for them. Um, but I'm just going to end with a couple of do's and don'ts for reporting on gender-based violence. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just a couple of things I felt I wanted to point out. And some of these things would apply to reporting on survivors or any kind of trauma, post-migration riots, displacement of any kind. Um, so a do, some of the do's would be if you're interviewing a survivor, just make them feel comfortable. Please always get their consent before you quote them. Um, and always tell them that you will go by their decisions on uh, how much detail they want to share. So they may tell you something and then say, I don't want you to write it and you should respect that. Um, it is definitely possible to still get all the facts and be have a perfectly accurate report without being intrusive or you know, causing further trauma to somebody who has already gone through a horrible uh, experience. Um, the second thing would be to listen carefully and uh, keep your tone very empathetic yet neutral because I, I at least, I, I mean, I think survivors don't want your pity, your rage, your horror, um, any of those things. Uh, some of the... Uh, some survivors may not, you know, be very forthcoming and talk to you. So you will have to ask questions, um, but do it without badgering them, really. Uh, you, this is the kind of situation where you have to keep adapting as you go along. Each person does not react to you the same way. Um, yeah. And um, so you uh, very often um, organizations help you get in touch with the survivors. So always keep the survivors or the organization who helped you get in touch with the survivor. Uh, keep them informed about the progress of the story. If it's being held, tell them why. If it, more details are needed, when it's being published, uh, just let them know. Or if for some reason your story gets spiked, just tell them why. Um, I'd also say that, uh, and if we come to some don'ts, uh, I'd, uh, I think just, uh, I think don't make promises to them because you know you can't keep them. Don't promise your story is going to get them justice. Don't promise your story is going to go national. I mean, you never really know whether you can, whether you will, whether it'll even run. So once you get back to the newsroom, fight for your story, but never make promises that you can't keep to either the survivor, male, female, whoever it is. Um, and yeah, just just um, also once your story is done and it's out. Try and keep in check in with them, keep in touch with them. Uh, I'm not saying you can follow them forever and, you know, I'm also not saying get involved in their lives, but just check in with them now and then so that you haven't just been this person who's got a byline out of them. I think that's also um, important. And uh, very important, uh, apart from not sharing details, I mean, writing details that you agreed not to, don't share their contact details with anyone else without their permission. So, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think that's all the that's all I have to um, to say about this. So, yeah, thanks.